exception, except to you. So. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. We have a, a real brain trust here with us from the Department of Commerce, and uh, we're going to go through uh, uh, a number of questions and then uh, be prepared to ask your questions from the audience. Uh, uh, first of all, my name is Joe Pelton. I've been in the space industry uh, starting uh, at uh, Intelsat, where I was head of strategic policy. And then I've had a number of academic uh, positions. Uh, I've been dean and chairman of the board of trustees of something called the International Space University. I've uh, had a space institute at George Washington University. And uh, largely, uh, I write books uh, today. I was explaining I've written my 50th book. And someone said, why so many books? And I said, I've heard once that uh, one book in 50 is a bestseller. I keep trying. So. Uh, and, and I will just say, well, on behalf of my publisher, I have a number out there. Uh, the latest one is called The New Gold Rush in Space, and that's sort of what we're talking about today. Uh, so next to me is Kevin O'Connor. He is the director of the uh, Office of Space Commerce at the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce, and uh, he leads uh, an office uh, that uh, is an advocate uh, for space business, and uh, we've had a session this morning where we've given him a lot of good ideas of how he could help uh, space business going forward. Uh, we uh, have next to him uh, Jim Uckmeyer. Uh, he is the regulatory specialist. Uh, he's the special uh, senior advisor to the Office of the Secretary. And uh, he works on uh, uh, regulatory reform. And uh, he uh, is going to talk about the, sort of the latest uh, with regard to the uh, uh, regulatory initiatives uh, that have come out of the uh, uh, space uh, policy directives. Uh, next to him, uh, we have Stephen uh, Voltz, who uh, has had a distinguished uh, career at uh, NASA and uh, with uh, uh, NOAA. And uh, he's uh, worked on a number of really exciting projects. Uh, uh, ISAT and uh, Calypso and uh, many other uh, uh, projects. Uh, we have next to him uh, Ian Steff, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Marketing. But that is not enough. He has two other jobs. Uh, he is uh, uh, performing the uh, function, the duties of the Assistant Secretary for Global Markets and Director General of the United States and Foreign Commerce Service. So uh, I hope you're getting triple pay for uh, all of those activities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then finally, we have uh, Earl Comstock, who's the Director of the Office of Policy and Strategic Planning at the uh, US Department of Commerce. And uh, he uh, serves as the Chief Policy Advisor to uh, Secretary Ross and uh, I understand his advisor on planetary uh, matters, uh, particularly Pluto. Yep. So that's sort of an inside joke for uh, any of you who uh, follow uh, space things. Anyway, uh, I'd like to uh, start out uh, by uh, uh, asking, uh, got to get out my possible questions. Uh, what path forward does the commerce uh, see with regard to space debris? and space traffic management, and uh, particularly uh, looking internationally to what's happening at the UN Committee uh, on the Working Group on the Long-Term Sustainability of Space and the IADC of uh, can we uh, exercise more leadership uh, at the international level, uh, and uh, what really uh, can we do and should we be doing? So. So I think what we've Simple seen. Simple question. So, thanks, Joe. <laughs> so I, I think what we've seen so far. Uh, I begin week three in my role as the director of the Office of Space Commerce. But what we've seen so far is a strong encouragement by the allies for American leadership on SSA and STM issues. Uh, I know there were discussions about this at COPUS a few weeks back, uh, and so uh, uh, that's that's the starting point for the conversation. There's clearly a role in leading a community that has similar values to ours as we pursue this very complex technical mission. OK. Well, Jim, I'm going to go to you next. Uh, but basically, uh, we have uh, 
uh, our good friend Scott Pace has been a, a dynamo at work, and uh, we've had uh, at <laughs> least three uh, uh, space directories, but particularly directory two and three have uh, basically set a whole series of objectives uh, with deadlines of uh, 120 days. Uh, uh, this is not the usual Washington way of doing things. Uh, anyway, uh, can you give us an update on sort of uh, how things are going and can we really expect those 120 day objectives uh, to be met? Sure. So in Space Policy Directive 2, uh, the department was ordered by the president to create a one-stop shop, a consolidated and coordinated uh, space office um, that within the office of the secretary. And that very same day we sent a reprogramming notice to Congress. Um, to try to make that happen. So that, that's pending, but uh, meanwhile, we're, we're working very hard to go ahead and get coordinated. Uh, people often wonder why commerce is getting new space rep responsibilities. They don't see commerce as um, a real space agency, but at the end of the day, as, as we heard all day, uh, most of what's going up there now is commercial. It's not government objects like it used to be. Uh, so we deal with these companies on a daily basis, whether it's spectrum management or remote sensing or international trade, um, export controls is one we hear a lot about. We're, we're touching all these companies on those issues. Uh, so we are, we've got a space team now that meets once a week, um, 20, 30 people uh, in a room that are looking at all the various issues and making sure that we are on the same page and we are coordinated. Because if we can't get coordinated, um, we're, we're not going to meet industry needs. And when companies come in to meet with us, rather than the, the companies walking down our the halls of our building, which is about half a mile uh, long. And instead, uh, we, we've, we've got a one-stop shop in the room. They can talk about all their various needs in one place. So we, we are also uh, working on remote sensing. We, we have an ANPRM that's public now in our collecting industry comment. Uh, that 60-day period closes uh, mid to late August. But you, you can submit comments now. You don't have to wait. So we, we want everybody to, to take as much time as needed but as soon as you submit the comments, we can start to uh, review and incorporate them. And we want to get a proposed rule out as soon as possible after that uh, comment period window closes uh, next month, uh, or sorry, late August. And, and you know, we're going to move fast. So the sooner we can get your uh, work product, the sooner we can address it. Okay. Well, uh, just uh, going over to Steve, uh, it as just Jim just said, people don't really think of commerce as space, uh, but uh, to do all the things that are required requires a lot of technical uh, expertise and so on. So is commerce going to get uh, enough expertise and uh, what kind of detailing uh, of people or other assembling of uh, expertise uh, is anticipated in the next, uh, uh, well, Whatever, wherever it can be done uh, without uh, additional congressional uh, authorizations or, uh, in other words, it takes money. I guess a large tin cup uh, is really needed to make all these things happen. So could you just uh, talk a little bit about staffing and uh, technical expertise? Probably not. But um, <laughs> I, I think the, the point, you, as James was just saying, is how there is, this is a, a new initiative that the Department of Commerce has identified themselves as the focus on. And as Kevin was saying, there's a lot of international interests. I think part of it, as the, the space program within the Department of Commerce, which is NOAA and, and our Satellite Information Service, um, we are, we're a part of a large organization, a community that's been doing this for decades, been operating in space effectively, working through the issues of space situational awareness, making sure we don't bump into each other in space, traffic management. So I think there's a there's a capability in the community and capability within NOAA to, to operate our systems. And what we're looking at with, as we look at STM and SSA on the Department of Commerce side, is to take that expertise and understanding and use that as a model sort of to help inform how the, the office needs to be staffed up. Right. Um, I don't think there's any intention of replicating or reproducing or replacing the existing intellectual capacity that's at the, at the Air Force, at NASA, at some of the other international organizations. But as I heard, one-stop shop or window shop, it's the front end and doing that communication in the commercial sector, that's the objective. So um, there is a significant management. It's space traffic management, not space traffic highway building. So it's managing what's there and not telling everybody how to do what they do. So there is, it, it's not so much technical that we have to add a, a bunch of full-time equivalent people to do the technical part, but we have to understand the environment, the groups, the, the players, 
and find the best management structure to handle that. So as you said, without funding, without authorization, we're not going to hire a bunch of people. But we are collecting the input and the community conversation about how what would be effective and what would be useful. And when I travel and see with our multilateral, multinational organizations, there's a lot of interest on what the Department of Commerce has done. There's a fair amount of skepticism about whether they, what they're going to do and whether we're going to be able to do it. But there is an awareness that is an unnecessary function to have a, uh, to have a framework for how we integrate these dozens or hundreds or even sometimes thousands of new satellites into the orbit construct where it used to be just a government playground. Um, so there's a lot of interest and skepticism, but um, involved players around the world. And I think they're looking for us to provide management ideas, not so much technical expertise. OK. Uh, Ian, uh, you're sort of dealing with markets and so on. And uh, in the last uh, few weeks, uh, I was uh, at the International Space University talking to one of my colleagues who uh, used to be at Ames who's now an employee of the government of Luxembourg, who set up a $200 million fund to get new space industry off the ground. And they've also passed a bill similar to what the US has uh, to kind of encourage new space business. Uh, other colleagues I met uh, are uh, from New Zealand, who also are trying to create new space initiatives and so on. And as we heard in discussions this morning, uh, the U.S. has a lot of regulations, and a lot of people are uh, thinking they have to go overseas and file uh, their filings uh, rather than through the FCC and the U.S. processes with overseas uh, <coughs> activities. So the real issue here is, is the U.S. falling behind in terms of space markets and ability to serve uh, space industry, and are they going to be attracted uh, by uh, these new funds and new initiatives by other countries? Look, well, thanks for the question. And I would say that uh, not only are we not falling behind, but we have demonstrated to the world and our partners that this is an area that we must maintain and grow our leadership in. Uh, we saw that firsthand. Uh, you know, I just returned from Farnborough uh, with Kim Wells and the rest of the International Trade Administration uh, team. Uh, and clearly, uh, what was on display there was the best of the best of American technology, American technology and partnership that the rest of the world uh, needs and demands. I would say uh, the other thing that is very promising is the services that the International Trade Administration within the Department of Commerce provides to our, our growing space industry, our advocacy efforts within ITA. Right now we have $4.2 billion worth of active ongoing advocacy projects on 29 different projects. These are projects that foreign governments are inviting U.S. companies to participate in and represents a great cross-section of the activity happening there. The other area that I would reference within ITA is the Select USA program. We realize, as the Secretary mentioned just earlier, that no one country nor no one company can single-handedly reap the benefits of space, and therefore we are inviting the best of the best in the world to come here and invest in our, our space community. Uh, the last area that I'd mention uh, is the, the thorough analysis that we're providing in terms of what those top markets look like around the world. Clearly, the market here is huge, but we're not the only market, and we need to make sure that companies are competing on a fair and level playing field in these markets. Okay. Uh, Earl, uh, we'll just continue kind of a policy. You're sort of the chief policy advisor uh, to uh, Secretary Ross. Uh, that it seems like there really are a number of challenges. Uh, we've heard a whole lot today about space debris and space debris uh, policies. Uh, when people file for uh, new systems, uh, they have to uh, file a lot of information with the FCC about what they've done to minimize space debris and what have you. Uh, but there seems to be kind of this uh, trade-off of that. On one hand, we don't want new space debris, but we also don't want uh, over cumbersome regulation uh, that uh, stops new initiatives. Uh, uh, another issue uh, that uh, at least has occurred to me is uh, in terms of this one-stop shopping uh, that we know what the uh, uh, FAA uh, Office of Space Commercialization and so on requires and licensing and what have you. Uh, and uh, other uh, things that the FCC requires uh, in terms of their 
frequencies and so on. But what seems to be missing when I read through the uh, policy directives uh, is the fact that there's also a need for an environmental statement and the fact that uh, there's an EPA in, in this process. And it seems to me that they may be the slowest part of this uh, getting things done. Uh, so uh, just uh, some comments uh, about uh, how this all works. In other words, you've got the FCC that's an independent agency. Uh, there's EPA that doesn't seem to be men mentioned in the directive and so on. Uh, can we really put this all together and have one-stop shopping and uh, do what we need to do to minimize uh, the, the space debris? It seems like a really hard task. Uh, so. well, th thanks for the question, and that's obviously something that this administration is very focused on, is uh, you know, what you've really seen grow up over the last you know, whatever, 40 years is a, a not well-coordinated process. And to take your example of the FCC licensing, you know, if you really look at the FCC statutes, there's really nothing in there about the space side as much. But they were a natural uh, spot. You have a treaty that says that uh, governments, you know, flag states are supposed to exercise authorization and control. So you start looking around, and at the time when these things were going up, the only real connection, the nexus, was these communication satellites. And so the, if you really want to go back into the history of it, the FCC's office evolve this larger thing because lawyers basically came in and said, you know what, somebody has to be supervising this. It's not just about your frequency assignments. Under the treaty, we have to say that you're being supervised. So they devised basically organically a process to do this. And this is what the, this administration is really focused on, is saying how do we sort of cut through this, this process where different things have been built up over time for different reasons. Um, you know, it made a lot of sense to run this out of the FCC when essentially all you had for satellites was communications. That There was a real logical nexus there. But as we look more toward a lot of manned activities, we look toward a lot of other activities in space, particularly in space commerce, the question is where do you now start to focus this? Your, your point on the EPA, one of the basic questions is, okay, uh, does the EPA have authority in space? Um, you know, we have laws that are written for terrestrial environmental protection. We've got ocean protection. Uh, there's not so much out there that I'm aware of that, that covers space. So from a policy perspective, that's a lot of the, what the, the role of the administration is looking at. What we are clear about, and I think what you heard from Secretary Ross earlier, is this administration is very focused on incenting companies to come here, choose us as the flag of choice. We want to make sure that we accomplish a number of objectives of not only leading in space, but making sure that we set up a process and provide the best uh, guidelines and frameworks for getting out there to make sure that we minimize the debris issue, we minimize the issues of uh, conflicting uh, trajectories, et cetera. So this is, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but I think what you have in this administration is a lot of uh, intent to get, get to the bottom of it and, and hopefully leave the situation well formulated at the end of the day. Well, you do raise an interesting point about uh, uh, regulation of, of outer space. Uh, but what people don't really, I think, realize is the fact that not only do we do have this issue of space debris, but uh, you know the various launchers we have have different uh, major uh, differences in environmental impact. And uh, you know a lot of the uh, solid fuel uh, rockets leave particulates and so on and that people really don't recognize that uh, pollution at ground level and pollution in the stratosphere is a quite different uh, thing. Uh, I, I did a, a, a paper uh, where, uh, or a book uh, where I asked someone to do a paper on uh, this issue mm -hmm. and I was told, uh, yes, I'll do it. And then uh, an hour later, the person come back and said, no, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, so it's a sensitive issue, uh, let's put it that way. But uh, I really do think that, that uh, uh, it's not only orbital debris, but there, if you are going to be launching thousands of satellites, and uh, a lot of them with uh, solid fuel uh, missiles and so on, it really could become an environmental issue as well. So anyway, uh, back to you, Steve. Uh, there has, uh, you've written a, a number of things about how we commercialize a number of things that uh, 
uh, have been government functions and so on. And uh, in Directive 2, there was an issue of uh, trying to uh, commercialize uh, some of the uh, current uh, meteorological services and so on uh, and so on. Uh, could you comment about uh, Directive 2 and sort of where we are in uh, that uh, aspect? Sure, sure. To, so to the role of, uh, so this is a very active conversation right, right. right now, the role of the public versus the private, commercial versus government um, sponsored systems in space and how they meet our mission needs. Um, we're just at a point within NOAA where we just are launching the, the first, uh, the next generation of satellites that will provide the baseline weather observations for the next 15, 20 years. Uh, but these were developed and designed 15, 20 years, 10, 15 years ago. So it's a long timeline for developing of satellites. But so as we got to the end of the development cycle, the design, and started launching these, we, just, we knew we had to look at a different approach. When we designed these systems of, in 2005, there was no small sat industry. There was no commercial space industry that was providing microsats or comber. You know, there were the combirds, but nothing in low Earth orbit of consequence. It's an entirely different environment now. And we realized that we have to, if we're going to fly something in 2030, it's not going to be what we flew in 2020 or 2010. So we went through a long exercise. We did an architecture study, basically, looking at the services we provide and seeing how we address those. And we opened it up entirely to government-owned and, and built, commercially provided services, commercial data sources that might be applicable, and even um, outsourcing just ground systems or communication sites, looked at the whole observing system and found that there are potentially strong places, avenues where the, we can outsource pieces of the observing system, not the whole system. There's, there's a reliability and a dependability function that is really the essential nature of a government service. You have to get the weather every day, and it's not something you're just going to outsource and assume and hope that somebody does a nice job. But things like we build the GOES satellite. It is a great Earth observing satellite, but it also is a communication satellite. That's uh, half of the, the bus is about power to drive comms up and down. There's no reason inherent reason why we can't outsource the communication side. Can we do the observing and then find a different way to have a comm satellite handle in the longer term the bandwidth to broadcast the, the signals in a different way? Now, that would be a change in our system, and we got to step into that you know, carefully, but that's a one place. Another place is hosted payloads where we don't have to build the satellite, we build the platform. We build the instrument. Or we you know, and we buy spots on a commercial satellite, which a comm satellite and geostationary, or maybe even some like Iridium if the instrument is small enough, where we use somebody else's investment in platforms, and we build it into our system. Those are two definite examples. And we've also been doing the last couple of years actually piloting the buying of commercial data, radio occultation data is one particular measurement, to see if a commercial sector, not just built selling data to the US government, but selling data more broadly, can sell it to us as well, so we get the benefits of their multiply or uh, putting the cost of it out on the whole sector. Um, and that's still in the pilot stage. We've got a couple of companies that have, we've contracted with. They provided some data, and we're going through a second phase to do that. And I think that will be a piece of the architecture going forward. So we've looked in this overall of uh, through multiple approaches to getting the um, opening up our long-term measurement needs to potential commercial providers and our service needs. And I think there's viability there. It will be, as we look at probably, it will be a hybrid system in the future. It will not be government-owned. But there will be government pieces, government only, because the reliability, the performance, accuracy, et cetera, are such that you can't, you know, you can't definitely get, go out to the public for it, to the commercial sector. But there will be large pieces that are commercialized through a long period of transition from the existing to the future state. Do you have a schedule for this of sort of like uh uh, does this show sure. in the next year's budget or what? So, yes. Um, uh, the commercial weather data pilot, which we started in 2017, is actually in the pipeline. And we have been funding that for a couple of years, and that will continue. Um, but we actually hope to put into the upcoming budget a request to actually go out with a hosted payload demonstration, for example. Um, another thing which we also are looking at in, is going out with an RFI within the next, that's a request for information, within the next couple of, within the next month or so, to offer a free ride to space for a commercial sector that wants to fly an Earth observing instrument. We provide the ride. We give them a platform on, it's called an ESPA ring on a launch vehicle. They get, the, they get to space at no cost. We get the data. And so if an Earth observing instrument that we want to see data like that, we're not going to invest in the R&D of a new type. But the measurement is very valuable to us. 
They get to get a space at our cost, but they get then the visibility of flying in, com in constellation with a NOAA satellite so we can do comparative data and observations. We get the data for free for evaluation and for exploitation. And so both benefit. So, so that's an example. And that's likely to, that, as I said, we'll have an RFI out within the next uh, couple of weeks asking for interest from the commercial sector. And initially, a lot of we've heard um, feedback said that's a good idea. We have satellites we'd love to fly, but doing all the other parts, getting the launch, getting everything else, and not knowing if anybody wants it is, um, has been a hindrance. By putting these sort of price indicators or these interest indicators out, we expect a positive response. And that will be a launch roughly 2022. Um, so there's a bunch of individual things that we've looked at with our, as I said, our architecture study, which we call in SOSA, indicates where we should start investing in some of these exploratory questions in order to inform the next generation satellites. Kevin, let's come back to you again in the context of things that could be commercialized and what have you. Uh, uh, I've uh, looked at a list of uh, companies that are basically providing uh, space situational awareness uh, services and, and what have you. And uh, uh, I came up with uh, AGI, which is sort of the main contractor for uh, uh, the Space Data Association, uh, Rencon, uh, Leo Labs, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Schaefer Corporation, Applied Defense Solutions, and my favorite, Exo Analytics, because uh, they were a spinoff of students of the International Space University who have kind of a different model. Uh, so can you uh, explain how this is all going to come together? Because you basically have JSPOC that supposedly is the source of all knowledge, but you have all of these people now providing uh, private data, and uh, you have uh, uh, the Space Data Association, and then you have a directive uh, uh, that says basically, hey, uh, Commerce, you're really supposed to be doing this for the commercial world. How is this all going to come together, and uh, uh, is there going to be uh, this continuing opportunity for business to provide space situational awareness services? Sure, I think this is actually one of the reasons why the Commerce Department should be in charge of this. The Secretary said earlier that, that the Department of Defense currently collects most of the data, and that will be the starting point. You know, we will carefully pursue how we would be the provider of that data in an acceptable model to the private sector. That leaves lots of rooms for the companies that you've mentioned and others to come in for pilots, experiments, pick whatever word you like, to try to raise the capability in all areas for both defense and also for purely commercial reasons. Right. Because uh, actually, it seems to me Again, we sort of pretend at times that the U.S. is the world, uh, but I, I know that uh, Australia has put in some new capabilities. Uh, Germany has a new uh, uh, optical uh, system and what have you. Uh, can we actually rely more on the world, and, and does the U.S. have to do this all itself, or can we create a global system that uh, uh, is... Uh, reliable and uh, gives sufficient information to the commercial uh, community. I mean, basically, the Space Data Association was the industry saying, hey, we can do some of right. this stuff ourselves. And uh, they had to fight with JSPOC to get a lot of the information they needed. But uh, is the Space Data Association sort of a model of what can be done to develop more commercial uh, activities? So I, I don't know that, that that's the only model, but I think there are a number of models, and I don't see any reason why we would preclude allied participation in an architecture, if you will, that will do this over time. Right. And, and again, just as a sort of background, you know, we do have the uh, new S-band system that's in the Pacific. Uh, there are rumors of maybe a new S-band system uh, in Australia uh, and, and so on. Uh, uh, what technology is the way forward? Is it S-band technology radar, or is it uh, uh, more optical systems, or uh, a combination, and uh, also more reliance on uh, well, things like exoanalytics? It just goes around and puts telescopes all over the world. I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, all of above. To, absolutely. We all want of to, above. We want to create as many opportunities for innovation as we possibly can. Right. And I, mean, I think that's part of the, the goal ahead. of the administration is to in setting up commerce and having us 
uh, be the interface for the commercial side of, of space situational awareness, you, you're going to continue to have the Department of Defense, which is going to maintain the sort of the, the catalog that they need to maintain. But the real question is, how do you create an interface where commercial companies can come in, provide this information? I mean, one of the, one of the things that's out there right now is the fact that you have essentially a two-dimensional picture up in space. And so we can say that two things are headed toward each other, but I can't tell you whether they're headed on an exact collision course or whether they're going to pass each other you know, five miles or 10 miles one way or the other. And so that's one of the things that commerce is going to be out there trying to set up is how do we ingest data and feed that back into the system and create opportunities for commercial companies. What we'd love to see is a private sector company get up there, put it put an asset in space that then gives you that three-dimensional picture. If there's some private company that wants to do that, then they, we would be in a situation where we could hopefully feed that data back in. And all the companies that are going up there, we'd love to have them have a, a point of access where they can feed us their data, their trajectory data, and other stuff so that we improve the basically of the overall picture for everybody. And we'll always provide a basic level, but there should be a commercial market to provide enhanced stuff you look at the insurance industry, and hopefully they're going to get involved and say, you know what, if you're providing, you know, if you take these certain steps and have access to this advanced database, we'll give you a low insurance rate. So there's a number of ways we can look at how to do this, but that's one of the reasons that they've, uh, the administration has chosen to, to create a civilian side agency that's going to handle this. If I may, there's another well, go uh, ahead, benefit to that, and maybe an uh, analogy of the Earth observation data over the years. Um, we've spent a big effort in the last 30 years to make Earth observation data from all the nations free and open. And by making and by encouraging others to contribute their data to a common database, you have a larger collection of data which the value is not in the observations but in the exploitation of it. So by having a civilian agency, as Earl was just saying, being the place where you can come to get this information, you don't have to negotiate with the Department of Defense, which are not good negotiators about opening up their data for obvious reasons. You, you create an opportunity where you have a bigger data set, more information, which in addition to getting more observations in, there's a lot more exploitation in that data set. Secretary Ross mentioned earlier about different ways to project collisions. So you have a different collision avoidance approach as opposed to what we might do, which is two-body, uh, two, two-line analytics where they just look at collisions. But there may be much more interesting and creative ways to use a complex a mixed data set to do trajectory analysis and to do fleet analysis for somebody who wants to fly a thousand satellites. They're never, the DOD is never going to do that. We're never going to do that. By making a common working space, they can, we can provide the information set and you can create a whole new industry of, of analytics, of analyzers and, and data managers who can work with those data in different ways. That's, and it just illustrates another reason why the Department of Commerce was, was selected for this, yeah. because of the fact that we have all of these entities across Space. Not only do we get out there and market, work with foreign governments, we've got tremendous experience in NOAA already setting these things up, and we're hoping to use those kind of models, the, the experience from the weather systems, to say, look, we've done this before in other civilian environments. This is how we can build on that experience and, and expand on it. Let me change the subject of that. We've been talking about ways of promoting business and so on, uh, but it seems to me there's several vital activities uh, that is a government function uh, that I'm not quite sure who's going to be doing what. Uh, and one of them is uh, cybersecurity and uh, what uh, can be done to protect uh, our vital uh, satellites. And, and, you know, many of our business uh, activities are now vital assets. Uh, uh, you know, if uh, Echo Star and uh, uh, Intelsat and what have you went down, that would be a big problem. Of, of what can or should commerce role be in terms of uh, cybersecurity. And uh, also, uh, uh, we really have looked at remote sensing and communications, but GNS services, uh, navigation and uh, timing services, are now uh, absolutely vital uh, service. Uh, uh, one of the things that people seldom realize is that if the internet went down, uh, I mean, if the uh, GNS systems, the GPS went down, that's used for synchronization of the Internet. We'd be losing the Internet, at least in a lot of countries and so on. So what could or should uh, your role be in terms of uh, cybersecurity and protecting of uh, vital 
resources. Is that something DOD does, or uh, will you have a role? Well, we already today have a role. Obviously, this is a cybersecurity as a whole of government effort. Uh, Department of Homeland Security plays a key role, but Commerce plays a, a major role as well. Through the National Institute of Standards and Technology, we have the cybersecurity framework. Uh, NTIA plays a big role as well in working with industry. So this is across the government. We, you know, many people don't realize this, but the Department of Commerce plays a big role in the Privacy Shield, which is the data transfer agreement right. uh, between the U.S. and Europe. So we have a lot of experience in that. Our role typically is to try to incent the industry to improve their standards. Um, there's others who have stronger regulatory authorities that, that could take a look at this. But the general approach has been to try to look at best practices and bring those along. Clearly, cybersecurity has got to be for, front and center for any company that's thinking of doing business in space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can, we can provide a lot of resources toward that. And we have experts at NIST who do this on a regular basis. But uh, you know, any company that doesn't take advantage of those resources that's out there is really asking for trouble. Um, so this is this is something the Trump administration is very focused on, and you'll, I think you'll see over the coming uh, months more activity on the cybersecurity front uh, to get out there and try to not only bring the public along but to take steps to safeguard uh, our critical industries. I would just add, uh, in terms of on the international front, uh, you know, we're very much. Uh, you know, working alongside our NIST counterparts to ensure that as those uh, foreign governments and foreign industries are moving forward on adopting new standards, that they mirror the NIST framework and other you know good best practices that we've developed, so people are not operating on you know 30 or 40 different um, you know sets of standards. And Privacy Shield goes right to that as well. And and I would add to from the perspective of somebody works working in space regularly now and working. On a, on a real-time operational basis with international and commercial partners, we are keenly aware of the need to uh, uh, maintain the integrity of the data all the way from observation to you to ingestion into the data systems and operations. So um, what NOAA having its own space agency within the Department of Commerce can provide an, a strong proof by example, a demonstration space for an example. It's not the only path because a government solution is not going to be mimicked by the industrial or commercial sector, but it shows where we, where we have issues and we resolve them and overcome them. It shows a demonstration of an approach to deal with a hybridized system with multiple different contributions to it and maintain a high security process at the same time. Well, you know, a lot of people, uh, we were discussing this morning the idea uh, that uh, people uh, go out and get a license for a, a new project and then don't realize, hey, there are obligations that uh, come with, with this. I'm wondering to what extent there should be more uh, effort to uh, bring along new companies to realize things that they need to be doing, not only in terms of filing and so on, but things like cybersecurity. Uh, I was on a, a panel that went to Japan and it looked at that none of the Japanese governmental satellites at that time, and this is a long time ago, had any real security against uh, fraudulent uh, commands to their satellites and so on. And I, I'm sure that a lot of people here say, gee, all we have to do is get these satellites up and uh, get them operational and then, then it's gravy from then. But there are some responsibilities. and. Uh, uh, I, I am wondering to what extent does industry fully realize the things like, hey, we need some cybersecurity on our satellites and make sure that there's no fraudulent commands and, and so on. Uh, is that something that you've thought about or something that we should be worried about? Uh, um, I'll speak first from the satellite side. Um, uh, we've been operating in space for 50 years, and it's not easy. And there are things you do to make sure your systems are secure. But I would not insist that that approach be used by a commercial sector that wants to do it as well. Um, they should go in with eyes wide open. So what we can communicate is the risk tolerance that we have and the reasons we made decisions we made and not indicate that you should do it the same way. I might put rad hard computer parts on my, compu my system so they're radiation insensitive to solar storms, but that makes a big, fat, heavy, power hungry right. satellite. Right. You want the one that's small and, and agile and you can launch in, in a year instead of 10. Go ahead, but for a solar storm, this is the risk that you're taking on. So the decision on an, uh, accepting risk 
is the decision the commercial sector has to make on their own, but they should make it with eyes wide open with information. And that's what we can provide, is the, the sort of a risk tolerance approach or a risk assessment that can then in help inform the commercial sector. But I wouldn't tell them what to do. Right. I tell them what, the, what might happen if they do it a different way. But that's up to them to decide how to apply their risk. Well, Steve, I'll, I'll throw sort of a thing, since you raised the solar storm issue. Uh, you know, there are <coughs> data now from the MMS satellite and the uh, uh, swarm satellite of the ESA that are magnetic fields are uh, changing and our natural protective uh, system against uh, major solar storms may be going down over the next 50 years and so on. And this could uh, wipe out our That's power That's the Department system. of Interior's problem. That's not my problem. Right. But, 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 but. <laughs> I don't do the earth magnetic field. This, this is your U.S. government work. Okay. Uh, that, but, but seriously. Uh, this is a issue that's starting to be uh, seriously looked at. I know uh, between NASA and DOD and the Homeland Security and so on, uh, I do think that this might be one of the things that uh, commerce really needs to be aware of, that uh, uh, if we really uh, are looking at a situation where uh, solar storms might become a bigger problem of what uh, we're doing to protect uh, uh, vital U.S. Uh, resources, but, uh, but also, uh, again, to alert industry mm -hmm. that this might be something that they need to uh, be more aware of. So it's, it's if you will, a kind of a information uh, uh, thing, but, just, just as right. you were talking about, uh, uh, giving them, here's our experience, here are the issues you should be worried about, and here's some of the things you, sh you should worry about going right. forward. You, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned MMS, which is a NASA satellite right. in its right. form, which is an right. ESA satellite. Right. So research satellites have been sort of in the forefront of space weather observations right. for the past decades. NOAA is just recently, within the last 10 years, started forecasting, well, 2005, right. I believe, forecasting space weather. And just within the past five years, actually launching, other than in deep space, some of our own space right. weather observations. Right. So we do see, and the, the, this is an all-government approach, that there is a need for a sustained government observation from, of space weather. Right. But there's also a need to improve modeling and understanding, which is more complex, which is NSF and NASA and others. And um, then what to do with those forecasts and warnings, the impact assessment, right. which is what does to the, inter, you know, to the energy structure system and others. So there, it is well understood whether the magnetic field of the Earth is changing over time is something we can observe, but not what we can do about it. But there is a, a clear consensus, I think, across the government and across the community that we need to be aware of and uh, better forecasting space weather events for their impact on the Earth. Right. And, and I don't know whether everyone knows, you can go to NOAA website and there is a dashboard that shows in real time. Space uh, Weather Prediction space Center weather is a NOAA weather well, forecasting office for space weather. Yeah. That just, I mean, this highlights, I think, part of the reason why this administration is so focused on setting up a better system for space, because before it's always been kind of a piecemeal. haphazard, piecemeal approach, and as you get a lot of commercial companies in particular getting up there, a lot more countries that are getting involved, uh, there is a need for greater systems. <clears throat> so you start with best practices, and you see how that works. If that's not working, you know, my advice to the industry is, again, um, it, it, part of what will happen as a function of your level of responsibility. If you get irresponsible actors up there, uh, then that provides a greater incentive for governments to step in and, and regulate uh, more to control that kind of behavior. We would certainly encourage folks to continue to work together, do the best practices, so we can keep regulation at a minimum. Uh, but it's precisely for those reasons. If we discover that uh, we're, we're creating greater risks in space because people are not uh, if market forces really aren't aligned properly to give people the right incentive, then uh, then you do have a conversation within government about what do we need to do to protect that. But what we're trying to do is get the systems in place where we can look and build on what's already been done, try to provide that cohesiveness, and then you can have a rational conversation about what, if anything, is, is needed be above and beyond that. Okay. And, and just want to follow ahead, up on that. Ahead. I didn't want to give the impression that anybody can fly whatever they want, whatever risk posture they want to take. There are there's a common field up there. And if you fly a battery that's going to explode, it affects everybody else if it explodes. So there are certain standards of, of behavior that we would expect of the commercial, everybody when that we've agreed to as a nation, as part of the community of nations, that we should apply. But put the standard at the right level about damage to others, not risk in your own mission, if you want to take that. Uh, a new thing that's uh, going to be happening, I think, uh, soon uh, is uh, space 
planes that are going to be flying suborbital. Uh, Richard Bigelow uh, seems to think that he's going to have private uh, space stations and so on. How is the world going to change in the next few years, and what role could commerce uh, should be playing uh, with regard to uh, the safety and uh, the operation of uh, uh, private uh, space flying uh, flights and uh, even uh, uh, private uh, space stations? Uh, I'll give that to you, Kevin. <laughs> so I think that's, uh, we've done some work in my prior life, we did some work with the high altitude platforms. Right. And that's, uh, as, as the lawyers in the room know, that's a, a nebulous space right. uh, between the space and air communities. Obviously, right. as those capabilities are growing, more capabilities come into market, those are issues that are going to have to be worked by, by both commerce, obviously, and at some level, FAA transportation. Right. But I'm talking about... Uh, well, in other words, we have this uh, area uh, I call protospace, sort of above uh, 20 kilometers up to 160 kilometers, where you have all of these things, high altitude platforms are stable. Uh, the possibility of not only um, these uh, suborbital flights for One. space tourism, right. but actually flights to and from places uh, up to 80 kilometers and so on. And when you're mixing together something flying uh, at uh, let's say Mach 6, Mach 7, with something that's uh, stable, uh, with no one in charge, uh, no FAA uh, right. in charge. Uh, I think, I mean, go, go ahead. Yeah, th there's many areas where you know it's the Wild West, right? And, and there are no rules. And as the secretary keeps saying, regulation doesn't always have to be bad. I mean, it's kind of the right. reg reform deregulation guy. I mean, that's kind of the posture I take is. How do, we, how do we cut red tape, uh, but also how do we regulate in a way that enables? I mean, we have companies coming to us saying, I'm going to put a camera on my device even though I don't need to use it to look at the earth, and you know, I'm not regulated by the FCC, and I'm not owned by the launch vehicle that took me up here, so commerce is the only place that I can go to, to be regulated, to get that government stamp of approval to, to take out and, and raise money and, and have a sense of certainty that the United States has my back if something goes wrong. Uh, you're, you're completely right. The, the types of activities in space are going to change drastically in the next decade, and, and we've got to find a way to implement best practices and standards and, and hope that an insurance market will, will come around that will help protect companies, uh, but also you know, regulate in a way that's not adding another barrier to new activity. Well, I think the key point here is that uh, we have never had a definition of where does outer space right. start. Uh, but for years and years, we had commercial space and then, uh, I mean, uh, commercial air traffic and then military traffic, and we had outer space, and nobody had any particular use for what I call protospace or subspace or what have you. And now we have all of these uh, things of high altitude platforms. Uh, a hypersonic flight. Uh, there's the idea of even robotic freighters that would fly above commercial space and uh, uh, even deep uh, dark sky stations and so on. And it's the whole Wild West. And it seems to me uh, that uh, industry and governments may have a lot to lose unless we can get something going. Uh, that's, but but I, you know, to, the, to the point, I think that's exactly why this administration is focused on this is because you, you need to put the, the structures in place. And the reality is, yes, if um, commercial flights between continents start occurring in that space, there's going to be a logical discussion to expand the FAA's jurisdiction right. and the European air traffic control system. I mean, that, that is a process that can be handled. Um, I think the question is nobody knows exactly what that's going to look like. Are we going to tolerate sonic booms or, or, you know, if they manage to hush them down? So, you know, you can sort of speculate about these things. The reality is there are government structures there, and things will, will step up and fill the void. What this administration is focused on is doing that in a controlled fashion as opposed to just sort of letting it happen willy-nilly. So I think there is a lot of focus on this. There's a lot of excitement about it, and uh, people believe that, to uh, James's point, you know, you may need some basic regulations mm -hmm. to align the market incentives in the proper way uh, and make sure that people don't get out there and decide, hey, I'm just going to pass off my risk on to all of the other players up there um, 
So, so you know, they're, we're going to put things in place. But I do think while things are going to develop quickly, uh, when, one thing we always tend to do is, is assume that things are going to happen much faster than they actually do. So when you say, what's going to change in the next five years? I would say nothing that we don't see right now. Uh, if you look 10 years out, yes, there will be things that we haven't been discussing as regularly, but probably somebody here in this room has thought of them. So, you know, it's, it's getting that process in place, and that's really what the government is, is focused on right now. Okay. Well, a new business opportunity, of course, uh, the space industry. Uh, how much do they get involved? Uh, are you involved with them in discussing some of these new risks that are coming along and whether they can help... Uh, uh, do that. And, and the satellite industry, the space industry played a very good role in terms of telling uh, people these are things you better do if you want to get a good rate from us. So uh, uh, any comments about working with the space uh, insurance, launch insurance, uh, or other space uh, uh, insurance people? Go, go ahead. Yeah, I would, yeah. I mean, on the space industry, I will just say that uh, you know, uh, there are hundreds of new entrants, you know, coming into the, the space industry, you know, each and every month. Uh, you know, part of that may be because there's so much excitement, uh, you know, in the industry right now uh, regarding the, the bold visions that have been outlined by the secretary and, and others. But I will say that, uh, you know, these, these hundreds of new entrants, uh, that's not going to be a phenomenon that disappears. I'm talking not just launch services or satellite manufacturers, but the materials providers, the microelectronics guys that uh, you know are currently <laughs> supplying you know perhaps the automotive industry, but see a new market here in the space industry. People like you know some of my former colleagues in Indianapolis that used to supply to the motorsports industry, you know are now supplying to SpaceX. You know that that is a fundamental change that uh, you know, will ensure that we maintain and grow U.S. market share in the space industry uh, to come. Uh, you know, and I think uh, you know, in terms of the, the International Trade Administration's part in this, it's you know, helping grow those, those potential markets and ensure those new entrants are having the conversations with those potential customers, wherever they may be, uh, whether they're in the U.S. or elsewhere. You know, those conversations are happening uh, real time, the engagement uh, you know has never been uh, at the level that I have seen it within the last you know two years. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that the secretary has asked me to focus on intently in, in the office of space commerce. The extent to which we can robustly engage industry in an organized and disciplined way uh, will be helpful to us in a couple of ways. One is that it'll help the government have early notice that people are coming forward with some of the ideas like the ones you just just spoke about. Second, they can notify us about either advocacy or regulatory concerns they have that uh, we can actually be helpful with proactively. Okay. Uh, let's go back to space traffic management. Uh, I have uh, been involved the last two years with some of the meetings that have been organized between uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization and the uh, Office of Outer Space Affairs and uh, copious uh, people discussing about what can be done, uh, how can we move from a wild west to some sort of structure and what have you. And those discussions have been interesting, but they have not really uh, gelled in, in any way. Uh, what do you think can be done in terms of international space traffic management uh, issues and, uh, and, or in the U.S. Uh, environment as well? Can, can we give people a feeling that something better is going to happen in terms of space traffic management going forward? I could start. Go, go I ahead. The first thing we have to do is, is come up with a plan here in the U.S., um, get, get our heads together and, and figure out working with industry. Uh, and industry wants this. I mean, as people are launching billion-dollar satellites, they don't want to run the risk of somebody else, um, you know, inadvertently or carelessly uh, allowing their object to, to collide. So industry wants this. We've got to set some norms and best practices uh, and then expect the rest of the world to come up to our standard. And there has to be some sort of, of legal remedy or enforcement if, um, you know, if that, that doesn't happen. And Earl can probably elaborate a little more. He's been our, kind of our visionary on some of this. And it, it is new territory. Uh, but but if, we, if we don't do it here first, we can't then coordinate with the rest of the world. And, and we, want to, you know, we want to set the standard first before somebody else does. Yeah, I think James you know, basically outlined that perfectly. It's, if you start at the international level, we'll get nowhere. So the United States really needs to take advantage of the fact that we have a large 
commercial space industry already developing. Uh, we have experience working through other international agreements, but it really, it, it's a practice of practice what you preach. So okay. we'll, we'll get out there, we'll try to work with our industry, come up with best practices, and then extend that uh, to our allies and, and other folks that want to work on this. Right. However, there is within uh, Copius a working group on the long-term sustainability of space and one of the issues that they are addressing is indeed uh, uh, debris and uh, space traffic management. And my understanding is that there have been a lot of very useful discussions and a lot of areas of, of, of agreement, but there is one uh, key space player who every time there's uh, close to agreement says, no, no, that can't work, and no, it has to be something different. Uh, uh, I, I think people on the panel here knows the name of that country, but uh, a controversial country uh, at, at times. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, do you think that process can be helpful, or do you think it really does be the U.S. has to kind of uh, work out rules of the road and then work with uh, uh, allies to implement this and then... Uh, sort of create soft law, so you, uh, so-called transparency and confidence building measures, uh, that approach, uh, uh, or somewhere in between? Well, I, you know, again, I think a lot of people like to think of something as new and novel. Right. There's relatively little on Earth that's new and novel. Um, probably your best bet is to look at what happened in the maritime world. Um, you know, we've been down this road before in this novel, new environment. And I think what you'll see in space is many of the same things that you see developed in the maritime world on, on Earth. And, uh, you know, I just observed there we have a law of the sea, which the U.S. was the primary driver behind. Interestingly enough, we're not a signatory to that. Um, but the point is, we set the norms. And I think that's a process that I would say was very successful. It's one that the U.S. has done in numerous other fora, aviation, not, not the least of which. So you know, yet to be decided whether it's a, it's a global agreement or it's a group of leading countries that set that up. Um, but I think the process is much the same. You have to get out there, build the experience, uh, look to what the foundations that have worked in the past. And these issues of liability and, and insurance really drive a lot of these things. And so I think we've, we've got models we can work with. They'll have to be tweaked to work with space, um, but it's all there. So it's, it's get out there and lead and then hopefully bring the rest of our allies along. Earl's a big Thanks. fish policy guy. He likes to take everything back to the sea. <laughs> <laughs> it all comes back to the ocean. Even, yeah. our, even our satellites okay. end up there usually. I have just uh, one more question, so I'm just going to uh, suggest to the audience you might be thinking about what your questions to the panel might be. Uh, so uh, one of the things that's come up uh, is the fact that uh, people in space uh, spend lots of money on research. Uh, NASA spends a lot of money on research and, and so on. And so the question is, will you have a research program? Uh, I think that uh, the secretary mentioned uh, that there would be something like a uh, center of excellence uh, that might be set up and what have you uh, that would be uh, with uh, commerce support or what have you. So uh, what is the research agenda and uh, what can we expect out of commerce going forward? I will just say that on the, the research front, on R&D, uh, you know, uh, Earl mentioned NIST uh, beforehand and the tremendous role that NIST plays in funding some of that basic research uh, uh, that was so prevalent uh, in my former industry, the semiconductor industry right. regarding, I mean, we mentioned RAD hard. I mean, a lot of these um, standards that were developed by NIST enabled future progressions of microelectronics that are now into space. So certainly there are key sectors that we're already funding uh, in conjunction with the university community. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, where the R&D needs uh, for this industry are determined and what projection uh, you know, we see, you know, that has to be an industry-led discussion. You know, the, um, if this is to be successful, we need to know exactly you know, where is that industry roadmap, where is it heading on the international front domestically, and then you start thinking, you know, where do those R&D assets at a whole of government level, where do they reside? And who can best, you know, interact with the industry and the university community to get that done? That's just my, uh, you know, uh, my, my personal 
you know, view on what, where the R&D uh, budgets are heading, and uh, I think there's huge opportunity, but the best R&D programs that I've seen uh, are those that are industry-led, uh, with industry participants, uh, and, uh, and then the government and academia uh, following uh, behind. And the space policy directives also speak to that. So, I mean, right. while we're all up here on the Commerce panel, the reality is commerce on, on R&D, NIST will continue to play a role in foundational research, as will other elements of commerce. But the real work on that is going to be in places like NASA um, and, and other departments. So again, this is a whole of government effort. And we're a part of that. And, and we're focused on the space commerce part. But uh, people shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there is a, a tremendous amount of other government entities that do a lot of leading work in the space field and will continue to do so. And again, uh, going back to the Secretary's uh, remarks, the whole idea of uh, drawing resources uh, from Department of uh, Transportation, NASA, and what have you to accomplish uh, your goals. And uh, while you still have your tin cup out there, I think that may be the only way to get all the expertise you, you need yep. uh, to move ahead f uh, quickly. So go ahead. Yes, please. You. <laughs> Two questions. Uh, number one, um, uh, I'm sorry. Could you could you say yes. who you're with? William yes, Lawrence, uh, George Washington why, University. Why don't you stand up so we yeah. can hear you? Thanks. Uh, William Lawrence, George Washington University, and I was in the science office at State for about five years and worked closely with the space office. Um, two questions. Many of the comments in both panels raise the question of space insurance, uh, and it relates to all the risk. So I was wondering if someone in the panel could talk about Commerce's thoughts on the facilitation and development of space insurance or whether that's even part of the conversation in terms of planning and risk and this number one out of about 279 what was a chance of accident and you know what you're thinking in terms of uh, space insurance um, second question is I know from my time in State Department um, in charge of some pretty large programs um, is that the US wins in science and technology R&D when it's leading and cooperating rather than leading and flying solo. And this relates back to what Earl said a minute ago. So I just wonder what your thoughts were uh, in terms of all the international partners with, that would like to work with the U.S., you know, how this will evolve into uh, working with a lot of friendly countries policy rather than just a U.S.-driven policy. I'm just going to say, starting with insurance, uh, I mean, that's something we're, we're just starting to look at. So we certainly have not figured it out. Uh, but what, what makes commerce such a great place to come up with, you know, long-term policy in space is that we, we're a very data-driven agency. I mean, our, our core function is to collect as much data as we can to provide information to the private sector and stakeholders so that they can adjust and, um, you know, reconfigure raw data in various applications that industry is, is best designed to come up with. So we've, you know, we've got the Bureau, Bureau of Industry and Analysis. We've got a lot of economists that are looking at, you know, various different economic indicators, and I think all of that will play a part in in this research. If you have any other ideas for us, come, please come in. And tell can, us. I, can I say one other thing on that? You know, historically, I've seen people propose things for commercialization to the government, and government people, well intended, have said, "Oh, that could never be commercialized. Come on." And so, space finance, space insurance re represent very important surrogate sources of risk that are neither the government nor the company per se. And so they're important indicators for us. A absolutely. And we just add to that, you know, in, in our particular case, you've got Secretary Ross who, with his business background, is very familiar with the insurance industries right. and the financing industry. So now is a, an opportune time for people who want to come forward and talk about both financing space projects and, and looking at insurance mm -hmm. models for this. We're very open to that and very, very interested in hearing further about that. Yeah. And on the second question, the, um, I think the it sort of tease off the first one is that uh, we're an information-based agency or department. We have NIST, we have NOAA, we have other elements within uh, the department who are very focused on collecting data and sharing information. And we do that on a technical basis in, t in many multilateral, multinational organizations where we define standards for interoperation. We define standards for observations and for data standards, et cetera, which allows us then to leverage the investments around the world by getting them to follow our lead. Back to your point, yeah, demonstrate sure. competence before insisting on compliance. So that <laughs> way, if we can do that, then we can lead by example. And that's really the way that we can leverage those multilateral, multinational organizations. 
the administration, you know, has an America yeah. First mandate, but not it's, only. it's not alone. It's America <laughs> First, but not alone. And, uh, you know, if there's going to be a market to, to have long-term economic growth, it's got to be people branching out and not just riding the, the piggyback of the big government contract. I mean, we've got to find ways to, to make money and have new business ideas, um, new voices in the conversation, not just the same insulated space community. And uh, that, that's going to take you know, all the different markets around the world uh, talking together on this. And then the secretary, every time he travels, you know, he says, oh, what space meetings can, can we get in there? So uh, it's definitely something we're working on. Yeah, I think just to be clear, I mean, we're, as we're very open to trying to work with other people. I think that the key is that if you spend you know, you need to you need to get out there and get the job done. And if people just sit around and talk, that's that's not going to get us very far. So it's it's a mix. We're, but we're we're open to the cooperation. We'd love to have people follow. We'd love to have companies around the world who want to come here and make the United States their flag of choice. So we're we're looking at that international cooperation side. But you know, back to the point, it, we need to demonstrate our competence. If we do that, then hopefully others will follow. Uh, just to add one point, I just got back from uh, a session of the International Space University. I'm on the executive board of the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety, and there's at least some talk of a joint venture between the International Space University and the IAAAS to create a space uh, safety institute in the United States, and it would be in cooperation with the uh, space uh, insurance uh, industry and so on. So it's just an idea, but we've at least uh, thought about uh, a number of aspects of what it would entail and raising some money to actually ha make it happen. Anyway, uh, next question, uh, please. Hi, uh, I'm Ryan Fedesiuk. I interned for the Aerospace Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So I kind of come at this from more of a security and deterrence perspective. So I'm particularly worried as we develop this space industry for the United States that our adversaries will see this and perhaps try to leverage U.S. reliance on space um, and per perhaps you know, target satellites. So what ways is the Commerce Department trying to deter those kind of attacks by cooperating maybe with the DOD? Are we like cooperating with other countries, not just our allies, but maybe adversaries? And in particular, I'm wondering um, if there's been any development in lifting the moratorium on cooperation with China on that front? Who wants to start with that one? <laughs> well, uh, a couple of things. One is the moratorium on cooperation with China is, is a congressional matter, so you'd, you'd have to look at that. Uh, obviously, the administration is looking writ large at what is happening in, in space, and um, I think all of us enjoyed a, a period where it was it was essentially set aside for peaceful purposes. Clearly, some of, of the other countries in the world have chosen that that's no longer a route. So the United States has no choice but to respond. And uh, that's why you've seen a real focus in the administration on space policy directives. We've got a national space strategy now. And you know the, the clear and unequivocal message across the world is we are going to defend our assets in space. And anybody that thinks that they can take advantage of that uh, will probably be sadly mistaken. Um, that being said, this is why there's a focus on commercial space as well, because we are interested in seeing it continue to be an area for enterprise and cooperation uh, across the globe. So while we'll maintain our, our space dominance, and we intend to continue to do that, we're also going to look at how do we facilitate getting uh, peaceful uses of space expanded and become a, another global marketplace. Earl, uh you know, we think so much of an attack as a physical attack. Uh, but to me, the biggest threat is cyber uh, uh, assaults and so on. And it seems to me one of the problems we have is that uh, uh, is a cyber attack a, a actual attack? And uh, how do we respond to cyber attacks? So could you just comment a little bit about uh, uh, that uh, problem that we have of uh, is a cyber attack really a, uh, an attack and uh, uh, a declaration of war or what have you? Uh, you know, again, I, I think right. folks who are interested in that can, can look at the, right. at the national policies that are coming out, right. the president's right. directives on those. But uh, you know, quite clearly, the United States is uh, 
increasingly treating something in a, a threat in cyberspace as no different from a threat in physical space. Um, and you know, we we would uh, just warn all all parties that they they uh, tangle with us at their risk. I mean, it's right. it's definitely something that is being very focused on by this administration. One point, point on this I think is important is you know protecting national security the, the answer to that is not oh let's try to stifle the you know supreme innovation of industry um, if, if we don't help businesses succeed here they're going to go somewhere else and then they're not subject to our legal regimes we, we lose control and uh, you know then we're subject to greater risk of attack so we've got to find ways to to help companies succeed and get the license approvals here um, you know while also protecting national security in the process and one other point from, from a point of view of somebody from, from the satellite side, um, resiliency is, is clearly a, a design feature that is highly prized in our new systems as we look to the future. DOD is looking for disaggregation, they call it, where they break up big satellites into multiple little ones. They design them that way. They don't break them up. Um, and, and, and as we look at our next architectures as well, having a, we call it graceful degradation of loss of an asset. So if you lose a satellite, you don't lose your system. And the commercial sector's got the same problem. They have to provide a service. They don't want to come down just because they have a single point failure takes down their whole service. They lose their customer base. We lose a lot more, but resiliency into the design uh, leads, is, is enhanced by more collaboration and participation. And so even those bad actors who want to take down our system take down their own at the same time. Um, and so that's, that's a feature in all of the system designs we're doing, and not just satellites, ground systems, IT, et cetera, being resilient to attacks um, or to uh, or failures of any kind. Uh, identify yourself and place this. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Warren, Lockheed Martin. So I have a less visionary question. Um, <laughs> a little more practical, if I might. So this, this is a great representation of visual of what the secretary means when he says one-stop shopping. I mean, seeing you all up here. Can you talk a little bit about how a new applicant comes in the front door and then what Kevin, you, you, you know, you do, I mean, you help us decide and how to reach out to Ian or, or whether we need to talk to um, Biz or can you kind of talk through that process a little bit? So I'll talk you through our initial thoughts on it. And we spoke to the secretary last week about this and I, I described four components. Uh, you've heard some of them already this afternoon. The first part is advocacy or encouraging a, a, a fruitful, productive business environment. And that's already been talking about, by, talk, spoke about by Ian and Steve in terms of advocacy, things done both around the world, but also done within the US government. And those are very, very different things. The, the second is removing burdensome regulations or modernizing regulations. Again, it was said earlier, not all regulation is bad. Uh, commerce thrives not in chaos, but it thrives where there's at least a modicum of, of, of regulation. I think the real challenge there is we have to find a way, the secretary said this, we do have to find a way to keep regulations as close as possible to rapidly changing business models and technology. It's very hard. One of the things I'm doing already is I'm looking for even other parallels in other industries where they've been able to keep the regulatory environment up to pace. Uh, third, I've mentioned this already for the office, is that we need a very robust industry engagement, but one that's disciplined. You know, the extent to which uh, we could meet eight hours a day for the next six years and we wouldn't meet half the companies that were involved. How will we process information coming in? What are the issues that companies really want us to look at to deal with effectively? But secondly, what kinds of high quality information are we going to put back out? When Steve talked about the space weather information before, that's the kind of unique government data that is potentially of value to commercial companies that are going to make decisions about how they protect their satellites. And so what other kinds of information, some of it may relate to competitiveness, you know, a whole range of things that are out there. Uh, the last part that I'm, I'm thinking of for the office is that we need to improve the narratives on how space affects life on Earth. Uh, I see a lot of data. I've got seen a whole set of charts so far. How can we describe for Congress, for other regulators, for regular people, the impact that space has on Earth. Uh, and that's as much sort of a color commentary, I'll use a baseball term, you know, sort of the, the, the color commentary person in the booth as much as the person that has all the statistics. How do we improve that knowledge? 
How does a licensee come in? Obviously, we're, we have to develop the process. Earl talked about trying to create a, a structure by which somebody would come in and say, we want to do this. Uh, again, I said earlier that we need to anticipate better the kinds of folks that are going to come forward so that the process is in place when they arrive, not the day they show up and say, gee, I need to get a license. How can you help? But we've already thought about that. OK, next. Yes, please. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, what is being done for uh, private entities who want to come in and do a joint project and uh, have meetings online and put up their own funding and get an economic consensus and get agreement? On what kind of project? Any kind involving space that they might want to put up a satellite or buy rights in some satellites, data, or Anything? Well, I, I think the first thing we're doing, and the, the Space Council has been a great resource just for, for coordinating all the various offices ar around the government. I mean, it, it truly is a, a whole of government approach if, if we're going to do something special here. Um, so as, as Kevin said, we're, we're welcoming people to come in and talk about their idea, their, their partnership, uh, what, what's it going to look like? I mean, is this, is this a research focus or servicing focused? And then, uh, you know, connecting them with, with the right office to be able to uh, bid somewhere or connect with uh, the appropriate lenders, apply for grants. Um, you know, just within the last couple months, uh, the department's Economic Development Agency and Minority Business Development Administration have both issued announcements, um, you know, for, for grant applicants to come in and, and seek some, some matching grant opportunities that are very innovative and kind of adhere to our, our space vision. So th those are just a few examples, but um, it, it's hard for us to to be able to um, you know read the minds of industry. So as Kevin says, if we're being very forward looking, we, we've just got to be able to talk to you. And I just you know add to that, you, you, I think really for the space industry, you're in a unique position. You have everybody from the president on down who is focused on this issue. You know, Vice President Pence has been a tremendous leader on this, and he's got the full backing of the president. I mean, that's just not something you've seen. In prior administrations. So you really have an opportunity here to help us build out something quite unique. And uh, you know, it's, it's the right point in time. You've got the right people in place. And as James mentioned, the Space Council has just performed this tremendous coordinating effort across the government. Um, so you know, while we're fortunate to all be in commerce, and, and the goal here is to try to give you a focal point for space commerce, space writ large is just playing a much bigger role and we're going to get out there and we're going to get people back to the moon head to mars i mean th th this is going to trickle down across the entire economy right. so uh, space is back and it's it's playing a bigger and bigger role and the great thing is you have an administration that's fully behind it i just want to echo uh, that as well and there's going back to your question as well there's no wrong door into this right. administration I mean, not only are we working together, uh, but we generally like one another as well. And uh, regardless uh, of where you enter this administration space, you're going to get an answer. You're going to get to someone that can help you achieve the, the initiative that um, uh, you're looking to achieve. Um, also, going back to the question from GW on the, the international collaboration, so I had mentioned that I just returned from Farnborough with uh, Kim Wells, who uh, leads our aerospace team in ITA. Many of you know her. Um, while there, uh, we had the distinct uh, honor of accompanying uh, Colonel Al Warden uh, to present a flag that flew on one of the Apollo missions to the Royal Air Force uh, in celebration of the 100th uh, anniversary. If that didn't tell you everything that you need to know, giving one of those treasures to a great ally like the UK in terms of you know, where are we heading over the next 100 years or the next 50 years of um, you know, as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo missions, that, that tells you everything you need to know about where we're heading. But again, we'll lead that alongside, you know, those that want to, uh, to come uh, with us. And I also wanted to thank, you know, GW for everything that you've uh, done. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure of uh, uh, working with uh, Professor uh, Pace at that time. And uh, I'll tell you, I'll never forget the time. I mean, first week in the class, you had to determine how much energy uh, you needed to get uh, you know, into orbit. I said, oh, gosh, I thought I signed up for a policy class. 
In essence, uh, you can't do policy if you can't figure out uh, <laughs> some of those tough questions. Uh, and so I just I wanted to do a shout out there uh, and Logsdon and everyone else that has contributed. Next question. Please. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Wiggins. My website's called Meet Me DC. My quick question is, as far as long-term cooperation is concerned, as you said, international uh, collaboration, right now it's hard for me to really see that working out if we can't work out a deal with China in the South China Sea as far as the expansion of the militarization aspect and drawing that analogy into space. So it seems like something's going to have to change as far as human nature is concerned between now and then because we have a tendency to be competitive and then adversarial towards each other. So is that going to fix itself in 50 years or so? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're thinking about it. <laughs> My own feeling is Russia may be more of an issue than China. But, yeah, but, it, it, <laughs> but, yeah, so the uh, there are always going to be adversaries, but they're, they're competitive. Uh, there's competitive collaboration as well. Everybody wants to do well and do better than, you know, like we compete with Europe all the time, but it's in a healthy spirit of competition. This, particularly the South China Sea, we, we work with, NOAA works with China, the Chinese Met Agency, on a regular basis. Collaboration, I'm, I'm a member of the CGMS, which is a coordinating group of meteorological satellites. It's been around for 45 years. It has about 40 nations in it. And, and you're sitting around the table with Russia, China, India, U.S., Europe, and we're calmly, easily talking about how we coordinate our, our meteorological satellites around the globe. So even though the nations may be competing or arguing or fighting uh, figuratively or actively in different places, there is a certain, there are, there are areas of common interest. Not cluttering the orbit of the, uh, the low Earth orbit is a common interest, notwithstanding the Chinese demonstration. You know, collaborating on science, uh, on observation techniques and interoperability of data, those are common interests that benefits everybody. So we can have competition or conflict, you know, conflict at the same time we have collaboration. And what happens, I believe, over time is the benefits of collaboration exceed the benefits of co competition. And you end up with getting more people engaged. We're now partnering with ISRO, Indian Space Agency, when they've been very insular for the past 30 years. And now they're are going to be operating one of their satellites from one of our ground stations because they see the benefit of getting, of getting being a part of a go coordinated group which is sharing data for mutual benefit. So there, are, it's going to happen. We're not going to be less. We're going to be conflicting each other. We're going to fighting for the rest of our you know species. But that doesn't mean we can't still benefit from collaboration as well. And I see that happening in our multinational organization. It really does come down to having a common interest. I mean, if you think about one of the first joint efforts we had with uh, the Soviets was actually on search and rescue. So SARSAT still alive, still active. SARSAT right. system right. up. Right. They had a common interest. Right. We had a common interest. So we, we were able to cross mm -hmm. that divide. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're, you're going to continue to see a difference of opinion with China on a number of issues. But that doesn't mean we can't continue to collaborate where it's in our mutual interest to do so. I'd just like to add the <clears> fact that when this all got started, and we and negotiated the uh, Outer Space Treaty. It really were uh, the U.S. and Soviets, if they agreed, almost everybody else could agree and so on. But today we have uh, over 80 countries in the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, and that includes uh, Cuba and China and Russia and so on. And the whole idea of getting unanimous agreement becomes very, very difficult and so on. So. Part of the problem that I think we have is that we do have a structure that uh, is uh, creaking because uh, we have too many countries trying to reach unanimous agreement on things, and that's why I think we are pushed back to what we've talked here today of uh, so-called uh, uh, transparency and confidence building measures and soft law and best practices and so on. And uh, then things can grow from there. But it is very hard to get things through the UN processes with over 80 countries on the committee. Next, please. If I may, um, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I'm wondering, we've talked a lot about, it seems like there's a lot of exploitation of some of the lower or orbits today, right? Um, I wonder, as we move higher and higher out of Earth's gravity well, um, say, Geosync or some of the higher um, orbits. Does the military worry at all about some of our very high value systems, uh, 
early warning satellites for nuclear missile launches and such, uh, once commercial satellites start reaching those altitudes. I don't see too many uniforms on this panel. <laughs> right. I'm going to be able to answer that. I think I'll go back to what I, I said a little bit earlier, which is, I mean, I, I think there's always going to be a worry when you have more and more things going up there, but uh, we're, we're reaching an era where it's tough to hide things in space. I mean, we have the technology right. to see pretty much where everything's at. So I think you're going to see the military adjust a little bit. I can't speak for them, but I think their posture is going to be uh, more enabling of, of commercial industry in the U.S. because, like I said, if we don't help people do it here, they're going to do it somewhere else, and it's going to be an even bigger problem at that point. But uh, you, you've got great cooperation among all the principals. You know, about a month ago or so, the secretary, um, along with Administrator Brian Stein and General Height, you know, they were on a panel together. They had breakfast that morning. They talked about all of these issues um, in a really exciting way, I mean, in a very intimate, friendly way. And, and it's a full whole-of-government team approach. And, you know, they're, they're all attentive and excited to see those big things happen deeper into space. Everybody wants that to happen. I mean, you've, you've got the secretary. He spent the weekend studying up on Jupiter and all the new moons and planets being discovered. So, I mean, that's, that's the type of person we're dealing with, and we've got to ride the wave of, of interest and excitement as, as long and fast as we can. The, the features of a good space traffic management system with the commercial and, and, and government LEO low Earth orbit are just as important in GEO and they're of, of intense interest to our, our DOD partners as well, just like AIS systems on, on ships. You want to know where they are, and you want to make sure they're all broadcasting the same way so you can track them. So it's definitely an interest. If it works well for all of us, it'll work well for um, our, our security side as well. OK. I see no further questions. I know that the weather is probably going to get uh, worse. Uh, so. Uh, I think uh, we, unless there's uh, someone wanting to make a last-ditch uh, question, thank all of our wonderful panelists for their... Uh